Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate the, co the committee inviting me up here to uh, give this talk today. Uh, I got about five minutes down the road into summarizing the projects on Lake Michigan. I said, nope, that's not going to happen in 15 minutes. So I've taken a little bit of a different tact. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the capabilities of some of the telemetry uh, transmitters and whatnot and maybe outline some potential ideas for Lake Michigan going down the road, if that's all right. So anyway, I guess at this point it's too late. We're gonna just do it. Anyway, so for those of you unfamiliar with GLaDOS, what is GLaDOS? GLaDOS is referred to as the Great Lakes Acoustic Telemetry Observation System. Um, it's basically a binational consortium of scientists who do collaborative, uh, who collaboratively use acoustic telemetry on the Great Lakes Basin uh, to understand fish movement. And basically we're looking to address fish movement needs that are uh, addressing uh, pressing management needs. So GLaDOS is not designed to replace any of the current assessment projects out there like gill netting or trawling, but basically it's to complement and to provide managers with information uh, that they can't get through traditional survey gears. Uh, so what does GLaDOS do? Well, there's a lot of different things that we do. Primarily what we do is we serve as a data repository or a, gather, a data gathering system where researchers can upload their data files and then can, they can actually leverage all the other acoustic receivers that are deployed throughout the Great Lakes Basin and then they just pull down their own fish detections regardless of where that fish is traveling in the basin if it's being observed on these receivers. We also provide a high level of uh, coordination, getting our researchers to talk and to uh, collaborate when it comes to projects so there's not redundancies. And then we also provide uh, some training uh, and whatnot as needed. So initially GLaDOS was funded with GLRI funding. Uh, however, uh, today GLaDOS is supported entirely through the Great Lakes Fishery Commission uh, because uh, the, the utility of this for uh, assessing fish population movements and dynamics in the Great Lakes Basin was evident early on. So where do we get our marching orders, if it were? Well, we get it from lake committees. We try, we encourage our researchers to interact closely with the lake committees and identify their management priorities so projects can be developed with uh, management input so that they're useful. So we'll shift gears here real quickly and um, talk just a little bit about an overview of the GLaDOS network. So here up here we have a uh, comparison of some stats from the GLaDOS network from 2023 to 2022. Uh, currently we, in 2023 we had about 183 uh, projects cumulatively. That's about a 17% increase from the previous year. And every year I think we're going to run out of people to bring into the fold, but we don't seem to be doing that. Uh, there was a 20% increase in members. Uh, over the previous years and again with the organizations I didn't know there were 119 different organizations in the Great Lakes Basin doing fisheries related work but apparently they are and so that even represents a little bit of an increase from the previous year. You know a lot of people like to become enamored with the number of fish detections and I think that's 806 million detections and that's that's nice but as a director the things that I look at are the next two statistics are that's the number of fish released so there were 4,000 fish released in the Great Lakes Basin last year. That was a 24% increase from the previous year. And then we have 3,300 active, 3, active deployments. So you're going to see 3,300 just about dots up there on the screen here in a little bit. So those are the things that I keep my eye on as director. So here's just an idea of how the uh, number of fish released has progressed through time. Early on, GLaDOS was trying to establish itself as a viable means for tracking fish. So you see there's just a handful of fish that were released and then through time, more and more fish were being released and you can kind of see the number of fish that were released over the last three years. Here we have a little, all those little uh, yellow dots. This is a, a, an evolution of the uh, network since it started in 2010 and you can see each year uh, more and more receivers are being added to the network, expanding the capabilities of researchers to monitor the movements of fish. So again, these receivers work very similar to the Easy Pass system on the, toll, on the toll roads. If a fish is tagged and it swims by one of these receivers, we're able to detect that information, and that information is stored on the receiver. And so this today represents what the GLaDOS network looked like uh, at the end of 2023. If we focus a little bit more closely on Lake Michigan, here I've zoomed in on Lake Michigan and what you will see is that there are two general areas of receivers on Lake Michigan. You've of course got Green Bay that's uh, 
littered with uh, acoustic receivers or there's a heavy density of receivers there as well as around the Beaver Island and the Traverse Bay area. So these are uh, in response to projects developing in these areas and so that's why you see such a high concentration of receivers. So in Green Bay uh, a lot of projects looking at the movements of walleye, whitefish and then some fish like uh, muskies and northern pike I believe as well in some of the shallow near shore areas and then of course on the eastern end of the lake you have uh, the lake, the lake big lake trout project evaluating the use of the sanctuary and then multiple projects looking at cisco and whitefish and whatnot in Traverse Bay. Um, from what I understand, the array in, uh, in Lake Michigan is going to expand in 2024. And so because of what they've been learning uh, in Green Bay, they've noticed a lot of fish actually leaving the bay and they want to get an idea of how these fish are moving out of the bay into the lake, main lake proper. And so the orange uh, dots here represent where the array will be expanding in 2024. Now, when I was at the, uh, the technical committee meeting at the end of January, there was some discussion about the potential for maybe a lake trout project in other areas of the lake. It, it seemed like some of the things that they were interested in were looking at the movements of wild and native fish and how they're utilizing the area, things like spawning site fidelity and just getting a better idea of, of uh, habitat use or lake use in Lake Michigan. And so uh, I, I kind of wanted to you know back up where say hey we, we we did a similar project like this in Lake Erie so in Lake Erie uh, much much to the surprise there are lake trout in Lake Erie Chuck all right uh, and it's you know it's not well known but there are good native populations of lake trout in Lake Erie and so the managers wanted to know where they were spawning they actually didn't know where they were spawning so what we did is in in spring when we thought they were mixed we went out there tagged a bunch of fish and then we put receivers along the perimeter of the lake trying to see where these things might, might show up. And so what we used is we used the locations of these fish during November and December when we thought they were, would be spawning and said, hey, this is where we think the uh, spawning areas are. So anyway, um, this was just one way that we used to identify you know, areas where these fish were congregating during the fall. So if we bring that back to uh, Lake Michigan, if this is maybe an objective or something that of interest, you know, something that you might need to think of is like, well, how would you put receivers in different areas to kind of detect this? Now, this is not a proposal. This is just a, a brainstorming of, well, what would it take? What might it look like? And so here you have two different array configurations. Here's one where there's a 25 uh, kilometer spacing that's very similar to what's going on in Lake Huron. And then there's a more dense one at 15 kilometers. And you can see how the number of receivers, you know, would vary. So right now, the biggest um, limiting factors for expanding these arrays is really it comes down to boat and vessel time. At the end of the day, that's where the issue is. And so that's certainly a hurdle that needs to be considered as you know, acoustic receiver networks uh, expand is how are we going to deploy those uh, receivers. Okay, um, moving forward, we'll talk a little bit about some of the technology of the acoustic, acoustic telemetry. It helps give just a sense of what is capable uh, with this type of technology. So you need to be aware that there are multiple vendors out there that make acoustic telemetry tags, and they're not all compatible. They are to some degree, but then there's also some proprietary information. And so currently, the Great our GLaDOS network is, uh, has been built with uh, InnovaC. That's where we started, and it's just we've kind of kept going with that. So if you are interested in uh, telemetry, be aware that, you know, there are some nuances to all of this, right? And I can't see this, my slides either. Okay, here we go. So there are also uh, telemetry is available in multiple frequencies. Right now, the majority of receivers in the Great Lakes are built on this 69 kilohertz. And with that come constraints on how small of a tag you can get. If you're going to go into like 180 kilohertz or 307 kilohertz frequency, which are the smaller tags, that utilizes a whole different set of receivers. Um, so these transmitters are actually quite unique in that you can have them outfitted with a bunch of different types of sensors. So some of the common ones are temperature, depth, uh, uh, accelerometers, and then we'll talk a little bit in a minute about uh, predation. So you're not just getting a presence absence. You now can start getting some, you know, information, some sensor information on the individuals, what habitat they're occupying, um, 
how fast they're moving or not moving, and so on and so forth. Um, so these are some of the auxiliary information you can kind of get with these transmitters. And there's also this archival feature. You can actually have these tags where they archive this information. Now the problem with that, of course, is that you have to get that actual tag back um, as opposed to uh, the other method is where the information transmits at the time the, re the uh, transmitter is going off, but only if it's near a receiver. So if it's in an area where there are no receivers, then you're not gathering that information. But as long as the fish is near a receiver, you can uh, un receive that information. Um, something to keep in mind here, not to get too bogged down with, it, with this, but of course, as transmitter size increases, the power output or the loudness also increases and the battery life increases. So if you take a look here on this chart here, you can see, you know, a smaller tag, maybe 137 days, and then the larger tags are 119 days, and then the larger tags can go up to 10 years. So it all depends upon the size and the battery life. So that's something to kind of keep in mind. And of course, what goes hand in hand with that is the smaller the tag, the less powerful of a signal it's emitting, and it won't be able to be detected as far away. In some of the upper lakes, we're getting a close to a kilometer to a kilometer and a half detection range with the largest tags. Um, moving right along here, we'll keep going. So in, in Lake Erie, again, uh, this is just because we're unfamiliar with it, we utilize this large receiver array network and we are actually able to understand the thermal ecology of lake trout over a four year period. So we're able to understand what habitat they were using throughout the year. So this was a, a good way for us to understand, you know, where they were setting up and what habitats they were using throughout the course of the year. Another one that's really kind of cool is now they've developed these heart rate loggers where you can actually surgically implant these transmitters up in the pericardium and it actually gives you an EKG reading of what that fish is, you know, experiencing during different parts, different aspects of its life. Now I will just leave it at, in theory, you should be able to identify when these things are spawning, but yet nobody has uh, actually used it for that uh, purpose. But I think out in the marine environment, they're starting to use that. It's trying to get an idea of how their activity varies throughout the course of the year. And this is how we use actually these heart rate loggers on Lake Erie with walleye, understanding how they responded to different anesthesia. So again, giving an idea of what that fish is going through physiologically at different endpoints. Um, I'm going to skip over this for now. You can combine acoustic and telemetry. Uh, acoustic telemetry is very, very poor in shallow weedy areas. So like when you're dealing with species like uh, muskies or uh, northern pike that like shallow vegetated areas, there's the opportunity actually to use acoustic and radio transmitters to kind of get the information you're looking for. This is very interesting. It's a game changer. It's a predation tag. So basically we're, we are pushing into tagging smaller and smaller fish. And of course, smaller fish get eaten. So. What's interesting about this tag is that if this fish, if a fish with this tag is consumed, there's a polymer on the transmitter. And when the stomach acid of the fish digests what it's eaten, the tag starts emitting a different code saying, oops, I've been eaten. So this is a really a great way of us to understand uh, like things like post-stocking survival and whatnot. And so here, these are some Cisco that were released in Lake Erie, and you can see the red ones indicate that the, the, the predation signal had been tripped. So in fact, these fish were eaten, uh, were released, they were eaten at some point, and then when that fish uh, was swimming around in the stomach of another fish, um, it was sending off the I've been eaten code, and we were able to understand what you know, what those mortality survival rates look like. So pretty interesting way to get at uh, predation rates. And the uh, Michigan DNR is actually using this on the All Sable River to start uh, looking, you know, evaluate their post, uh, uh, post uh, stocking survival of steelhead smolts, right? I think that's the steelhead study. Yep, correct. So anyway, um, um, and then what they were able to find is that, yep, we released them and then a certain fraction of them make it out to the lake, but a larger fraction of them actually never made it down past the, rece the, the, the receivers. We had 100% detection efficiency, meaning if a fish theoretically was moving down through there, it would have been detected. So that means a lot of fish are also being lost to other causes, probably mammalian or avian uh, along the way. <clears throat> So uh, moving right along with respect to uh, GLaDOS research initiatives. So we are trying to work actively with folks like the sail drone and the uh, AUVs and whatnot to see if we can incorporate this acoustic telemetry monitoring 
uh, technology on these different platforms. So we've been making some slow progress and would certainly like to talk more with folks about that. Um, we're always looking at tagging effects. We want to make sure what we're doing is not impacting the behavior of those fish so that the parameter estimates that, the man that we're giving managers are in fact reflect what's going on with the population and not being biased by what we're doing to the fish. Um, always looking to support projects like uh, that support management decisions. Uh, Travis Hartman will be presenting later on, I believe this week, on how we've used um, uh, eight different walleye projects to develop a tool for managers to look at walleye movements. And then also, of course, how lake, influ lake processes influence fish behavior. I think we've done a very good job of understanding how we need to tag these fish and we're getting be able to tag smaller and smaller fish, but now it's why are these fish moving around? So marrying the abiotic data with the fish movement data, I think is one of the next things that we're trying to actively pursue. And then this is another uh, initiative of mine is the small fish tracking system. Like up until now, we've been uh, you know, tagging things like walleye, Vikings, you know, uh, and Vikings, no, uh, not Vikings. We haven't tagged any of those buggers yet. Uh, uh, white fish and so on and so forth, Lake Sturgeon. So we've done a good job with the adult fish, but now we're pushing down into the smaller fish. And so we've actually made quite a bit of uh, progress with that. Daryl Hondorp and folks have been tagging gobies. I didn't think it was possible, but you know, starting to put transmitters in gobies, fish down to uh, 62 millimeters. Again, that's on a different frequency, but still we're developing the ability to tag those smaller fish. This past fall, I believe a bunch of juvenile lake whitefish were tagged and released into Traverse Bay. So again, starting to push that envelope and seeing uh, how small fish we can tag and you know what their survival rates ultimately i would like to see us tagging things like rainbow smelt and alewives and releasing them out into the, the lakes and seeing what their ecology is and seeing how much they really move around uh, and whatnot in these large systems so with that this is going to be a plug for uh, we are hosting the international conference on fish telemetry uh, in traverse city this coming uh, in 2025 so that's going to kind of be neat. This is a conference that goes to South Africa, Japan, Australia, Norway, all over the place. So we're going to be, we're, we feel proud to be able to host the folks this year up in Traverse City. So with that, if there is any time, I can take some questions.